Hi, let's look at the history of microbiology in a nutshell. How were microorganisms identified for the first time? Who is the father of microbiology? What is the germ theory? These are just a few of the questions that this introductory part of the course in Basics of Medical Microbiology will aim to answer. Interestingly, the history of microbiology does not begin with scientists, but actually begins with lens crafters and cloth merchants and their lenses. One such lens crafter was a Dutch gentleman named Zacharias Jensen. As a way to become competitive in this trade, Jensen began seeking for better ways to make lenses, which then led to his invention of the first compound microscope. According to the records, at the time of his invention, Jensen was probably only 15 years old. Jensen is said to have used the help of his father who taught him the trade. The eyepiece lens he designed was made of two convex lenses as shown here. And the Jensen microscope was a sliding tube assembly uh, capable of magnifying images up to nine times. In 1609, Galileo Galilei developed a compound microscope by using a concave and a convex lens. His microscope was more advanced than that of Jensen. In this barrel model, Focusing was achieved by twisting the barrel to move either closer or farther to the specimen. He called his microscope as oculino, meaning small eye. He further described it as the small glass for spying things up close. However, in 1625, it was Giovanni Faber, a German doctor, who gave the instrument its current name as Microscopio or Microscope. Now, the first account of microscopic observations were actually published in the same year by an Italian named Francesco Stelluti, in which he described the anatomy of a bee. Before the 1800s, scientists were named as naturalists. Robert Hooke was an English naturalist who became a curator of experiments of the Royal Society of London in 1662. As a curator, he was responsible for demonstrating new experiments at the Society's weekly meetings. He used a microscope that would have uh, magnify a specimen 25 times to study many of the small living organisms including insects. He described the details of his microscope and drew the anatomy of the insects he observed. On one occasion he took thin shavings of cork and placed them under the microscope. Then he observed several little boxes that he called a cella from which we derive the word cell, which is shown over here in the middle. He also drew the structure of a fungal mold as shown here. In 1665, the Royal Society published his work known as Micrographia which revolutionized scientific investigation. Robert Hooke is known as the father of science. Anton van Leeuwenhoek, a contemporary of Robert Hooke, was a Dutch cloth merchant who wanted to use lenses to inspect the quality of clothes. Although not much educated, after seeing Hooke's Micrographia publication, Lewin Hook became skilled at grinding glass pieces into fine lenses. 
he placed a single converging lens between two brass pieces riveted together as seen here. With this single lens, Luen Hook's microscope could amplify objects more than 200 times. Since his curiosity of the microbial world increased, he took a sample of cloudy water from a marshy lake similar to the one shown here and placed it under his microscope. He then described hundreds of what he thought were tiny animals that he named as animascules. These animascules were probably protozoa and algae. He recorded these observations and sent several letters to the Royal Society of London. In 1676, his notes included the first description of a bacteria. Anton van Leeuwenhoek is considered the father of microbiology. Now, the belief that certain living things can arise suddenly from non-living things without the need of a living progenitor to give, li give them life dates back to the time of Greek philosopher Aristotle in the 4th century BC. In fact, Aristotle believed in the theory of abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is the basis of the notion that there is a spontaneous generation of living matter from non-living matter. The typical thinking among both naturalists and lay people in those days was that fleas could arise from dust or that maggots could arise from meat that was putrefying or decaying. Abiogenesis became the predominant thinking among naturalists until it was dispelled in the 19th century. These naturalists were known as vitalists since they thought that life depended on some mysterious vital force that pervaded all organisms. Some of the misconceptions that were associated with spontaneous generation were miasma, a contagious power that had independent life of its own, neuma, a vital force, of heat that emanated from non-living things to the living and malaria meaning bad air that could cause disease. These concepts remained unquestioned until the 1600s when the beginning of scientific experiments took place. Before we continue, let us see this diagram of the life cycle of a fly. Adult flies lay eggs. Within a day, the larvae emerge from the eggs. These larvae are called maggots. These maggots eat for several days to a week, storing enough energy for molting and becoming a pupa. Then, in 10 to 20 days, a fly emerges from the inside the covering of the pupa. Now, one concept of vitalism was that decomposing wheat grains generated warm like maggots. Leeuwen Hook observed the decomposing grains with his microscope and could see some eggs laid in the grain. He then suggested that the maggots were originating from the eggs and not the grain itself. Since these conclusions were divergent, Further investigations were required in the form of experimentation. This debate over the origin of life elicited a scientific tug of war, if you will, between different naturalists that either supported or refuted vitalism. It all started with Francesco Redi challenging the theory of spontaneous generation. 
then John Needham reinforcing it, followed by Lazarus Spallanzani challenging it again. However, some questions still remained unanswered until the famous French scientist Louis Pasteur put an end to the debate. Let's see how all that happened in the next lecture.